And this is how we welcome you to Artistic Spot, a show about art, talent, and entrepreneurship, where you are also the artist. In Artistic Spot, we're actors of our movies, singers of our musicals, and writers of our books. My name is Jose Rodriguez Marmol, and I'm your host. And we are recording episode 105 from Fable, Studio 150. And sitting right next to me, it's artist and roller coaster creator, Chris Gray. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh... You know, it's funny, the roller coaster thing is my real job. <laughs> uh, I own a small company here in town where we design and build roller coasters. Uh, we have a great team of people that are located either here in town or scattered all across the nation now due to COVID. Uh, but yeah, that's the primary task at hand. Uh, but I've always painted, I've always drawn things, I've always created things with my hands, uh, a lot of models and things like that since I was a kid. So yeah, now I'm in Orlando. So originally from Kentucky, what brought you to Orlando? If we go back in time and start talking about your story as a kid, and what made you do the wonderful things that we see around the studio? <laughs> and of course, this magnificent models of roller coasters. Right, right. You know, it's, it's really funny. When I was eight years old, I, that was when I realized that there was something fascinating with things that ran on tracks. So parallel rails, if you will and uh, became fascinated with trains and, and train trussles and roller coasters, for instance, and ultimately was taking lawnmowers apart. I would literally knock the engine off of an old push mower and we'd build a seat on it and push each other over the hills uh, at my grandmother's house. And just thought, this is what I want to do. And from eight years old on, I have been drawing and coming up with ideas for amusement devices forever. It's crazy. Um, Growing up in Kentucky, poor, uh, didn't have a lot of money to go to school, probably really didn't know how to go to school. No one in my family actually went to college. And so I ultimately wanted to go work in an amusement park for a couple of summers and had set up a deal with my aunt or cousin in Ohio to go live with them, work at an amusement park when I was, I think I was 17 or 18. And my mother and father were, you know, no, you can't do that. You can't go live with them. You can't be a burden. And, uh, so I was like, well, I've got to get out of town. I've got to find a way to get some money to have an education to do what I want. There's no way I've, anyone's just going to hire some, you know, podunk kid from Kentucky to help build roller coasters. So I would join the U.S. Navy. Uh, I was a CB. I actually went to boot camp here in Orlando. Wow. Uh, and funny enough, the day that I graduated boot camp, I told some of my family members that there is no way in hell I'll ever live in the city of Orlando or Florida. It's too hot. <laughs> And it was and almost are, 20 right? years to the day almost that I was back and moved in and I'm living here. But, you know, in the time of being in the military, I, I served, um, I think I was in 10 different duty stations in five years, including Iceland and Spain, uh, California, Mississippi, Florida. Uh, so I was kind of moving all over the place. Everything I owned would fit in my car. Wow. That's how I remember when I left the military to come home out of Pensacola, Florida, everything I owned was in the car and drove home, moved back in with my folks, uh, ended up going to a small tech school in Lexington, Kentucky, got an associate's degree, started teaching there before I had actually got out of school, uh, AutoCAD and, and minors in engineering and design theory, uh, but then ultimately moved to uh, Pennsylvania, worked with a company called Great Coasters International for 13 years designing and building rides. And the original plan was never to be there for more than five years or five rides and when it was over said and done it was 13 years and 20 some rides wow. and uh had traveled the world no joke before i was 40 i'd been to all the continents but three you know so we got to see and do a lot of crazy stuff i lived all over europe i lived in asia a few times uh building rides and then ultimately as much as i love wooden roller coasters that's all we did and three of us that were working for that company had all friended one another over the years and decided that we wanted to do more than just wooden roller coasters. We wanted to build steel rides. We wanted to build kid, kids rides, uh, kid coasters, uh, anything that had been an idea in our head since we were young kids. Uh, and funny enough, I still have all those notebooks from eighth grade on wow. of doodles of a roller coaster stuff. And so we left Great Coasters, started Skyline Attractions here in Orlando. Uh, and that was seven years ago. And so far, we, funny enough, we design and build, or we should say, we design all the roller coasters for great coasters still. Uh, but we have two of our roller coasters under our belt. And we just released last week our kitty coaster ideas and lines. So the designs for that. 
um, which is doing very well. We've had a really great response on on that across the internet. But uh, yeah, so just moving forward and trying to figure out the most fun and bizarre way to throw a human around. And that is amazing because, of course, roller coasters, you are in Orlando, which is the center of theme park and the theme park industry develops right here. Right. So we're in the very middle and the heart of it. But tell us a little bit more about Skyline Attractions. You said that dates from 2014 and yep. you guys are members of the International Association of Amusement Parks very much. and Attractions. Right. So talk to us a little bit about the story behind that. I know you have mentioned you have done roller coasters for other countries in other countries and other cities and everything. But which was uh, which has been your biggest inspiration in order to get that done? You know, it's one of those things where the inspiration always comes from you've wanted to do this since you were eight. And when there's something that your mind locks onto, it's almost like Asperger's. <laughs> it's like, I, I just want to see this through, you know, and that's always been kind of one of the great things. I always say they're all my babies. They really are, because it usually takes nine months to a year for one to happen. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, there's a couple that I've always really loved. There's some that are absolutely beautiful to watch. And as I get older, that's where I kind of draw myself to. It, I don't ride rides as much. Of course, I ride them if, at least once. Uh, if it's one of our rides, we usually ride lots. But I actually really enjoy just watching. And it's funny. It's really fun to watch people ride it, of course. But for me, it's just as fun to watch it run mechanically without anyone on it, especially when we're doing the testing at night and things like that, where you just sit there and you're trying to basically dial all this in to make sure that it functions and works it, as efficiently as possible, right? And that's always a really kind of interesting side of what we do for a living that a lot of people don't realize, you know, what it is. And for us, yes, it's a roller coaster. It's something that you're going to get on and enjoy. It's going to make you forget that you're living on this planet and you have bills to pay. Yes. But for me, it's a machine that we've created from nothing, right? So it starts as an idea, uh, literally just a sketch on a little chalkboard or something. And then three years later, there it is in real life. And that is possibly the most rewarding part of the whole thing is when you finish one of these big projects, then you go back and you look at that photo that was taken of that chalkboard three years ago. And you're like, damn, three years, we went from that to that, right? And we did it from scratch, you know? It was, so all the drawings, all the fabrication, all the build, all the testing, all that goes through us. That's the coolest part. Now, Chris, talk to us a little about the mock of the roller coaster you made in Iceland in 1995 that yeah. you brought for the show today. Tell yeah. us the story of behind that and what made you bring that specific mock up for well, us for Artistic Spot. You know, funny enough, this little model that we're going to show you guys, um, it, 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 it's kind of bizarre how people are always interested in seeing it and they think it's some gigantic thing, you know. And, Ultimately, what it was is I was a 19 year old kid stuck in Iceland uh, in the military and I didn't have a lot to do. I couldn't go out and party until I was 20. Right. And I started doodling in a book and I was like, man, it'd be cool to put uh, what we call a suspended roller coaster inside of a castle area. And I love and am fascinated with castles. It's, it, they blow me away. And so. I basically sat down, I did a quick like sketch of what this thing could look like and how it would kind of interact with the towers of the castle and the walls and the doors and all the stuff that goes on with a castle. And then thinking about how the ride would work, a, a true suspended coaster from way back, they were actually hinged. And when they went around a curve, they would swing around like, mm -hmm. like a bird, right? Or a dragon. And so I called it the path of the dragon. That was kind of the thing. And uh, ended up building this model and it just turned out amazing. And, and, you know, again, it was in 1995. I was a 19, 20 year old punk, right? <laughs> With nobody knew who I was building roller coasters or anything like that. It was just something I wanted to do. And plus it, it occupied enough time to keep me kind of out of trouble mm -hmm. uh, in Iceland, at least until I could drink legally. <laughs> so, um, but then it's actually traveled the world with me. This little tiny model has literally been in almost all the places that I've ever moved to. And it's, it didn't survive a couple moves, so it's been rebuilt a couple times. Uh, but now it always lives in my living room and I'm looking at it anytime I'm looking at the TV. Wow, that is amazing. You have a lot of stories to share, but if you were able to choose one, which one would that be and why? Oh, 
there's so many, but you know, I think one of the, the greatest stories was when my mom and dad realized what I was doing for a living was real because when I was a kid, they always said this whole design and roller coaster things, no one does this. Uh, funny enough, they're right. Uh, no one did it. 40 people in the world might be doing it, right? Still to this day. Yep. Um, and so it wasn't something that seemed like it was a real thing. And I think, you know, of course, they were parents nervous about their kids trying to chase a dream that they thought oh, this podunk kid from Kentucky has no chance whatsoever to pull this off. Mm -hmm. And just go get a real job. Just I heard that a lot. Just go get a real job, right? Just get a real job. And so I'd worked for Great Coasters for two and a half, three years. We did a ride in Dollywood, which was about three hours south of my parents' house. You know, we got to meet Dolly, which was hysterically funny. That's stories in itself right there. Uh, I've actually got to hang out and meet Dolly a few times since wow. then. Uh, but we were doing the tests of Dollywood on Thunderhead is the name of the ride. And so my boss would always go to the top of the lift hill to scan the whole area to make sure everybody was clear. Everybody had uh, everybody that w had things going on. They all had radios, including me. Uh, at that time, I was the train guy. So I took care of all the mechanics of the train and make sure it functioned and worked properly. And the first run is always a little hair raising because you just don't know what you're going to get into. You know, you don't know if the tights track or the track is tight or yes. or, you know, anything crazy that would slow it down and make it not make it home. Uh, so Claire, the boss, goes to the top of the lift. My business partner now, Jeff, which was our head of engineering, was in the station. And I was actually hanging out in the station with Jeff as well. But when the train finished, it was going to come into the maintenance bay park so I could go inspect it so we could go again because you want to go as fast as possible. Well, my mom and dad came. Wow. And so they were there. I mean, the whole day is this big anticipation buildup where everything's get. It's almost like the music's building louder and louder and louder and louder until somebody says go. Right. And then everything goes dead silent, which is pretty, pretty wild. And so everybody's talking on the radio. The train gets to the top of the lift hill and we stop, right? And then once we get to a point where we're ready to go, everything's scanned, we throw what we call throw the train over the lift as fast as you can. So you basically just power it on and you go, right? And is that to test uh, security and safety? Yeah, so it's basically just to make sure that everybody's clear, okay. All right. right? And so the train goes over the top. It makes it all the way through the circuit. And, you know, everybody's clapping and cheering and it's slowly coming into the maintenance area where it's programmed to stop so we can check it. And you hear across all the radios, Chris, go check this train now because we want to go right now, right now. So as soon as you're clear, let's go. And as I went running back through the station to uh, back to the thing, my mom and dad were in the last stall, not waiting to ride, but there with the crowd. Right. And they're both crying. And I knew right then. They got it. It was like, holy shit, it's real. They, to them, it was finally, this is not a plaything anymore. This is a real job. And so I think that was the one thing that legitimized what I had worked for. And my parents really had no clue what I was doing for 10 years, right? And then finally, they never said another word, never again. It was like, oh, okay, where are you building the roller coaster at now? That's where are you going now? You know, it was one of those things where you would call up the folks and, well, I'm going to China this week and next week I'll be in Holland, right? Uh, either trying to sell a ride or come up with a good design for a ride or go do maintenance on a ride. It was all one of those things. But I was literally traveling six months of the year uh, the entire time I was working for Great Coasters. And funny enough, I go back and look on Facebook memories now. You know how that lines you up in it. I had a memory two days ago and it said... This is my first weekend at home in three months, but this will be my last weekend at home until Christmas. And I was like, good God, man, I was literally all over the place. So I think I spent more time in airplanes than anything else. So it was a crazy, crazy time. Uh, and then ultimately when we started Skyline, you know, we're a young company, we don't have that much business going on overseas. Of so course. there's not as much travel anymore, which ultimately is, I kind of dig. I, I finally found a place that I love living in um, I'm lucky enough to have lived on a lake here and uh, I never really want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> that is a wonderful story. And I want to go back to that day with your parents because I saw you got a little bit emotional. Yeah. So how did your life change after you saw them? 
And that particular experience made them realize that what you were doing was real. How did your life change as a human being after you got that approval in a certain way from mom and dad? You know, funny enough, that's a good question. But at the same time, I really don't remember it changing a lot. I just remember thinking all the family now seem to think that I am rich. <laughs> I was like, that's the little furthest thing from the truth. Uh, but at the same time, I was always the one that they would come and ask questions. And I'm like, why are you asking me that? You do if you should know the answer to that, or this is a pretty crazy thing. It was like, I was the guy that suddenly was the one that was trusted with questions. And I always thought that was strange. Uh, it's probably not as, as much anymore, of course, but it was a very interesting time where the family was like, oh, wow. And funny enough, you go to boot camp, for instance, and everybody always says, you know, you go to boot camp as a kid and you come out as a man. And I remember you know, the, my parents saying, wow, you really grew up a lot in two months. But ultimately, I think the when they really knew that I was on my own and good was that day. Right. Because anybody can go to boot camp and be in the military uh, with just a little bit of drive and make the way make your way through that, because there's people pushing you the whole time. Yes. I never had to have anyone push. I was always pushing people out of the way. Um, and that was kind of that bulldozer mentality is. If I can't figure it out, I either go through it, over it, or around it. But whatever it takes, that's what we do. So, and sometimes one of those is a hell of a lot harder than the other, but it's the only option. True. And that's the way I've kind of lived for a long time. Did you find any obstacles on the way? Oh yeah, of course there, you know, a lot of times it was obstacle. The biggest obstacle was dealing with other people. It still sort of kind of is, but um, you know, the older you get, I think the more you learn about, <laughs> It's about how you react to someone, not necessarily how they react to you. Yes. So, or towards you or whatever they say to you. It, you know, somebody can come up and say the meanest, most hateful thing. Uh, and it's all about your reaction at that point because they, they put their line down in the sand, right? And at that point, you either, you want to step over it or you can slide past it, like I said, or you can go through them. Uh, and it's all about, you know, what kind of human do you want to be? Yes. And for me, I always say, I want to do the right thing no matter what, right? I've had a lot of people ask me, what's your political beliefs and all that? And I was like, listen, we don't need to talk about that, but I'll tell you this right now. I don't care what you believe in and what I believe in. I just will tell you this, I'll always do the right thing. And it won't always be the right thing for just me. I think about it as a blanket. Like who can we help, right? Who can we either teach or try to elevate to another place to try to make them think in a different way, right? It, and so that's always kind of been the thing. And funny enough, if I have, you know, we've, we've built rides everywhere, but when you have someone on one of your rides, they are living in your moment. You created that for them. They don't think about anything else, right? And so that's the one kind of cool thing that we get to do as ride designers is to take people away from all the other stuff that they believe in and think about on a daily basis or minute by minute, right? We make them live in the now. It's like when you go down a river, yes. right? So if, say you're floating down a river, most of the time, the only thing you think about when you're floating down the river is what's right in front of you, right? It's the same thing when you're on one of these rides. All you can think about is what's happening right now, yes. right? And you'd never really look that far ahead of, of time on one of these things. It's always what's going on right now. And funny enough for me, I'm kind of spoiled. Um, and my friends give me a lot of crap over this, but a lot of times I can just talk to you like we're talking when we're riding a ride. And they're like, well, you just shut that up. <laughs> You're making me more nervous by asking me if I'm seeing this thing. <laughs> so it's always quite funny how that works. But typically when I'm on a roller coaster, I'm, I'm as cool as a cucumber. And I'm always working. That's the other thing. I'm listening and watching, you know, trying to, you know, I don't know what to say, but I'm always kind of inspecting it. Yes. Right. And so every time I ride a ride, I'm always working. I was... Years ago, I was dating this gal and, and we were trying to get a picture on Thunderhead at Dollywood. And we rode three times. And she goes on the, the second time, she goes, you have got to stop. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> she goes, every time we come around the thing, you're like looking at something in the train and not having a good time. And she's like, you know, freaking out. Of course. And I finally had to just go, <laughs> that's all I could do. It was so hard to like let yourself go because it was always work, right? Yes. So, but it's one of those things when, when you're lucky enough to find something that you love and you can do it for a living, it's 
it's really unbelievable. Um, it, and again, you know, everybody always says the job is a job, and it is true. There's days that are not great. There's days that are amazing. Typically, that's when the ride is done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's down and dirty. It's the whole ability of taking another human away from their day to day. Yes. And we literally make them forget that they're going to die. Well, sometimes they probably think they're going to die, but you know, it, it's we've erased that for a fraction of a second. A movie, a good movie, does the same thing. True. Right. It, it kind of takes you off to another plane of existence and. So I've always said a roller coaster should always work like a movie or a book. Uh, it's funny because my business partners think this is like crazy lingo for me just talking, but I think a ride needs to tell a story from the time you lay eyes on it to the time you're walking away from it. And the ride itself is the middle of the book, mm -hmm. right? So there's an intro of walking up to it and walking under it and through it. And it's, you know, it's, it's, you smell it, you can hear it. Uh, you can hear people screaming and it's starting to tell its story. Then you get on your ride, it tells the meat. And then as you're walking away, that meat is still lingering in your head as this other thing is still moving around you. So it's kind of got a, a beginning, a middle and an end. And the middle is the ride itself. So, but I've always talked about, for, for instance, the path of the dragon model, going back to that. That told a story from the time you laid eyes on it to the time you got on, to the time you rode it, and then walking out of it. There was a story being told all the way through that. And you were literally watching a dragon destroy this castle, right? And so that was kind of the medium for the whole thing. Of course. Now, Chris, your life itself has been a roller coaster. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the other side of creating these beautiful and magnificent models and the paintings that we see in your studio here at Fabo? Yeah. You have been painting since you were oh, a kid. Yeah. How do you handle to bring a perfect balance between your full-time job, which is as an artist because you create roller coasters and right. make stories for people, and the beautiful paintings that we see around Studio 150 here at Fago? Yeah, so I've always kind of said this, and it's really crazy. The, the world that I live and work in uh, for a living is exact. And everything that we do is down to an exact pinpoint place, you know, whether it's a micrometer or it's the fifth decimal place in the center line of a track. We're always looking at all these little things and it's all very well defined, right? And it has a place to live all the way down to five decimal places sometimes, right? When I paint, I'm completely free. Like I can do whatever I want. There is no, there is no rule. There is nothing to follow. Even when I'm painting a picture of a picture, it's still very limitless. You know, I can do whatever I want and I tend to think about it that way. Uh, the other thing is a lot of times when I'm painting or creating a model, I go away. I'm no joke. I am in outer space. I don't a lot of times hear a lot of things going on. I don't see anything else. It's this hyper focus that it's sometimes so intense. Someone can come and talk to me behind me and I'll acknowledge that they're there, but I'll have no idea what they said. It's the weirdest thing. It, it's almost like your ears shut off. Um, but yeah, that's always been the painting has always been the freedom that I've never had on the other side. Of course. Um, and funny enough, even when I painted and, and drew things as a kid, you know, it was always based on going to school or being in the military and everything was perfect and had to be exact. And then finally, when I was able to paint or draw or sculpt, I was free. It was the it's the best. I wish I could do it more often, actually. What's next for Chris Craig? Uh, you know, I would hope we get to build a bunch of these little kitty coasters. I'd like to buy a house. <laughs> that's like the biggest thing. I, I think life goal, that's probably my next thing. You know, ultimately is sell some rides. Hopefully the company gets very successful and um, able to buy a house and just kind of hang out. So, and if I had my druthers, I'd be on a lake because ultimately if I live on a lake, I don't want to leave. So I don't need to go on vacation if I live on a lake. So I've been here for seven years living on Conway and I haven't took a vacation since. So my vacation happens every Saturday and Sunday if I'm lucky. Yes. So it's quite good. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. If you were able to tell our audience or watching this episode on our YouTube channel and everywhere podcasts are available, what message would, will you tell them and why? Be persistent and whatever you have, your dreams, 
you know, everybody says, you know, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's true. Look at me. I, I was some poor kid in Kentucky that literally fought his way to the point that I'm at now. And I'm telling you, it's possible. You just have to be willing to pay the price and the price is time. So, uh, you know, one thing that you don't think about is when you have these ideas and these goals and these dreams, uh, you know, it's hard to put time to that. And sometimes it can be 40 years. Sometimes if you're lucky, it's three. Um, but don't give up. That's the greatest part is literally just try to continue to push forward to what you really want to do, because the reward is finally doing what you want to do for a living. So and there's nothing greater than that at all. It's nice not having a boss. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I so, strongly agree. Yeah. Where can people follow you if they want to be part of your story and the magnificent things you do here at Favo, creating roller coasters, skyline attractions? Where can people discover more about you? Yeah, so if you go to Facebook, I have two pages on Facebook besides my own personal page, and it's Chris M. Gray, um, and it's linked to the other two as well, but there's CMG Artistry. Well, CMG is Christopher Michael Gray, and CMG Models, which I've been I've had that now since the late 90s. Uh, professionally building models for amusement parks and then also some architects and other things as well. So there's a lot of great photos there. There's a lot of history there. Right? A lot of times I'll go back and look and it's hard for me to believe that I have actually produced this much work. Uh, and when you look at it, you're like, good God, you know, it goes all the way back. And I'm thinking I could literally have a, a part of a museum do a whole roller coaster series now because I think I have 36 of them out there or something wow. like that. It's really crazy. And you don't think about those big, gigantic pieces like, you know, a painting, for instance, those pieces sometimes take four or five months to complete. Yes. So it's a it's phenomenal. But at the same time, it's crazy because time flies and it does. The next thing you know, you have a body of work, mm -hmm. you know, before, sure. if you're lucky, you have that before you're 40 or 50. So, yes. yeah. Well, Chris, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for joining us yeah. in episode 105 Artistic Spot. It has been an honor. Same. To get to know your story. Thank you for sharing this insightful information about who you are, but more as an artist, who you are as a human being. Yeah. Thank you. We're honored and thrilled to Same. have you as part of our story. Thanks. And for those of you, our audience, thank you very much for joining us in another episode of Artistic Spot. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel under Artistic Spot. Follow us on Instagram, RJJ Design, and Facebook, JJ Arts and Design. And of course, don't forget to tune us back in next week in Artistic Spot, where you are also the artist.